Okay, so I think it's time for a little bit of an update. So a couple of weeks ago, I revealed a, a new project I'm working on, which is going to be a, a, a manual way to shift your automatic transmission. And uh, we're finally on to something. So this right here is the Nifty Shifter V1. And we have turned it into something real. Okay, so here it is in all of its beautiful, beautiful glory. Look at that, huh? It's a... Uh, it's, it's nice to see something in person because it really gives you a much better idea of what you're looking at and what you're working with. But here it is. Here is version one, and uh, this one is uh, for the older models. So uh, before I get in too deep, um, I just want to um, go over a lot of the stuff that I've been doing lately isn't just for Renix anymore. So um, don't feel like you guys are left out. There's a lot of products that I'm working on that is going to be for everyone. So... Try to get out of the mindset of just Renix because it's it's it, uh, I'm working on getting more than just Renix. So always make sure to check because we're always expanding. So this setup um, is going to be split into what I'm going to call two generations. So we've got a Gen One board, and then over here, which I haven't put together yet, we're going to have a Gen Two board, whatever the heck that is, Gen Two. And um, yeah, it'll depend on what vehicle you have, but this will work on 86 to 96, and then Gen 2 will be 97 to 2001 plus. So just so you have an idea of what we're doing here, these right here are the transmission computers that you'll find in your Jeeps. These are what control the AW4 automatic transmission. So this right here is the HO version. It's got a green port. This one is the Renix version, which has got a gray port. But otherwise, they're fairly similar with really just different code and, you know, very minute stuff. Uh, somewhere... And then, Gen 2 is going to look like this. So this is what the OBD2 computers look like. They're a lot smaller, still made by the same company, but... Yeah, they're just, they're so cute and puny in comparison to the old chunky models. Even the connector itself is different and smaller, which is part of what makes this annoying. Because I have to have two different boards, but, yeah... I'm gonna have a version for OBD2 guys as well completely plug-and-play So now that we've got the years out of the way just wanted to explain that this is gonna be from you know 1986 all the way up to 2001 plus so we'll have to see specific compatibility with uh, whatever years you guys come up with But this is what it is the nifty shifter v1 So let's talk about how it works so underneath your dash uh, usually the passenger side you will find your transmission computer and a nice little plug in there. So this is going to be a plug and play uh, setup where this guy will plug into here, just like that, snap into place. And then you plug your factory harness into the new controller like so. And with that setup, you now have all kinds of manual control and stuff and whatever the heck you've ever wanted. So now we're due at the tip of your fingers, just like that. So there's no cutting, no splicing, no annoying things. All you gotta do is take off a couple screws on your dash panel. Heck, you can even just peel it back, unplug it, plug this in the middle, and then run your, your connectors and stuff. So it's really easy, really simple, and convenient. So I'm digging it. I like how this is uh, progressing so far. So yeah, that's where we're at. Uh, before I go and start talking and running my mouth and all that, let's go out to the Jeep and see how it actually works. Alright, I think it's finally time to test this bad boy out, so we're going to take off this dash panel. Just uh, some screws that go down the line, and then don't forget there's one right there, one on each side. And then we can peel this back and get to our prize. So that is what we're after. Now I'm going to do this the lazy way and not take out the left side. So hopefully I can reach in there, unplug that, and we'll put this in the middle. Okay. So, we got the uh, factory connector unplugged, we plugged in our uh, in-between board, plugged the new thing in, we got our screen and our, um, our shifter over here. So, I think we are ready to tango. So, if we turn on the ignition, we should get some cool things. Okay, look at that. We got power, and we can see what gear we're in. Ain't that badass. Okay, so uh, something interesting 
uh, that I should mention is with this kit, this could be your own uh, transmission computer. If you're doing some kind of manual buggy and uh, you don't need the transmission computer, you don't need auto shifting or any of that weird crap, you want full control all the time, none of this flip-flop shit, and you want to you wanna be the brains of the operation, this can do it for you. So we can just deal without this plug and just plug this directly into your harness and this will do everything you ever wanted. And I have a software option so that it starts in manual and just stays in manual no matter what. So uh, yeah, with a torque converter button, you can flip the torque converter on, everything's all Gucci. And uh, yeah, that could be a really interesting idea for you guys that uh, just need a real, you know, basic setup. Um, so yeah, I guess we're gonna plug this into the computer and uh, go for a little drive. Okay, so here we are out for a night drive. The REM fired up. We got this guy just hanging in here for right now. So this is just auto mode. Just to see the gears. So look at that, we're in second. Third. I don't know if I can get fast enough on this road. Okay, you can see our torque converter is locked. There you go, fourth. And when you let off the gas, the torque converter unlocks. So anyway, we got a joystick over here, so we'll input our code, we'll do two, three, four, okay, we're in manual, we're going to put that in the first gear, and now we should be in manual mode. We didn't get any errors from the TCU, so... The way that this works, we can throw it in reverse. We're still working just fine. Okay, put it in drive. So now, there's gonna be a, mis a mismatch. So the transmission already thinks it's in second, but it's not, and she's holding gear. So now, we're gonna flip this over to second. Second gear. Hey, look at that. Cool. So we are fucking cruising now, partner. Transmission thinks it's in third, but it's not complaining because it doesn't know the difference. Hey. Okay. Don't hit that fucking mailbox. So now we're going to come over here and throw this into third. So we're going to go up and over. Third gear. And we'll go down. And we're in fourth. Although honestly, I didn't feel much of a shift there. But yeah. And then, oh look, we want to come to a stop. Well, let's throw it third. Okay. All right, throw it in a second. Throw it in the first. Huh. Not really any engine braking, so that's kind of disappointing. I was hoping for more. But with the way that the gear is going, it's definitely in first, but when you let go, it just cruises. Like, there's like almost no engine braking. That's so disappointing. Yeah, she works. All right, I dig it. Still got a nice rattle daddle clunk dunk. Who knows what the fuck that is? But yeah, she works like a dream, partner. Get the light in here. So just so you could see what I was doing. Second. I got a third. Fourth. 
So the only thing is with this gated shifter, you just got to be cognizant of this flip-flop over here because it wants to flip. If you, if you saw that, watch. I'm just going just gonna to push it this way. It's going to do that. So that's the only annoying thing. And if you want to stay, go back to auto mode, you just leave it in neutral. It'll count down and boom, back in a neutral. Not a problem. Cool. All right, well, I'm gonna go for a quick little drive and just try this out some more, see what I think. Okay, so I just wanna give uh, some updates. I've been trying this out and it seems to work pretty well. So here's the good news and the bad news, I guess. So as we found out, when we're in drive, we don't have any engine braking on gear two or gear one, uh, so that sucks. When we're in third position though, we do have engine braking on two, okay? But we have to drop down all the way to first, second to get engine braking on first and second. Two, uh, one, two, and three both have the same amount of engine braking on second. So for instance, this is engine braking first, this is engine braking second, and uh, I think this is engine braking third. Third is should be active in all gears and so is overdrive except for D, you know what I mean. So, I don't know, it might just be easier to use the the in in the built-in shifter because we need some mechanical shifty business to do this. Um, but yeah. I don't know if I can show it on camera very well. But, uh, so we'll, we're in D right now. So we'll go for a drive. So we're in first gear. Let's put this into second. Okay. So while we're while we're in drive, when we let off the gas, it just kind of free spins. It doesn't really do anything. I don't feel like I'm slowing down that much. And when you get on the gas, it goes again. Now we're gonna throw this into third. Okay, but we're still in second gear. Uh, let me get around this bend real quick. So now when I let off, there's a, a slightly more noticeable drag. So we're going, and we let off, and we got a bit of a, a back. When we throw it in a drive, we go and we let off. Can't really feel it. So in second, we do have that. There it is, oh yeah. You can tell she's slowing you down. But if we throw it into first, right, it's in first, she'll go. But then we let off, and she just free spins. It doesn't really do anything useful. So the only way that we can get the engine braking is to manually move the shifter. So if you're not gonna use fourth gear very often, you could leave it in third, but that's still not the most ideal. We still gotta put it into first second if we want engine braking on first. Oh yeah, there's that chunk. So with this setup, we're going, we're in first, and when you let off, oh yeah, you feel that nice pull. Throw it in second, shifts into second, and you let off, and it's got an okay pull. But you put it in a drive, and she doesn't do jack shit. So that's something to be cognizant of. That is a bit of a downfall, but it's one that I think people should be aware of. So there you go. That is the uh, the Nifty Shifter V1 demo, and what and all is possible with this. Cool. And so when you turn it back on, it always defaults to auto. Arp. Okay, so hopefully that gives you a really good overview of um, you know how this device is planned to actually work. So. It's got some good, some bad, and some uh, in between. So this is the main board, and we're also gonna have a smaller board to go with it. This is gonna be for the adapter. So this here is for our joystick, and it's gonna have two different things on here. To stick with the current theme, we've still got plug and play over here, so if you buy this particular joystick, you can just plug it right on in, and she's good to go. Uh, there will also be um, screw terminal thingers, uh, on either side for directly wiring it. And they're all labeled, gears one through four. And then over here we have uh, dim, 
uh, ground, the shift uh, like on and off, and the torque converter. So they're all in there, and they'll be wired up to things like this. So just little screw terminals that you can stick wires in. So if you need any manual things, you can do that, or you can interface with this. This does all the basics. This is gears one through four and ground, which are also labeled. So that's an easy joystick connector right there. Over here is our screen. So there's not a whole lot going on yet. I didn't really uh, cover this up or make a case for it yet, but just four wires and it plugs in. Um, and the nice thing is, since this uses I squared C, we have different options available. So we can do different types of screens that we can just plop on in there. But that is the basics of uh, the kit that you would get. So, um, yeah. I don't know where to go. There's a lot to talk about. So I guess first we're going to talk about just the general idea. So I'm working on a case right now that this will fit in, the Nifty Shifter V1. So this whole thing is just going to slide on in there so we can have our access and all that. But I made this case a bit too tight, so I'm trying to clean it up and make it fit and work right. But to give a basic idea, it's going to look something like that. So it'll plug in, it'll look very nice and fancy and professionale. So that's the idea so far uh, for that. So when I get the case figured out, we'll be good. So currently, well, the features that we have is we can we can show the gears and everything that we're in. We can flip between an auto and manual mode. Uh, you know, really easy, either through software or a physical switch. So if you want a physical switch to go from auto to manual, that's easily done. Um, we have options to lock and unlock the torque converter uh, through software or a switch. So that's another thing. If you add a switch, you can get a uh, torque converter control. Um, and uh, we also have dimming, so you can run a line into this for from your, your dash. Uh, lights, so it'll automatically uh, dim the screen with the dial, so you can turn it up or down, or we can manually dim it. Uh, we also have an option for a light sensor that I may or may not do. It depends what I'm feeling um, and stuff like that. And yeah, basically through software, we can do just about anything we want. So on Gen 1, we're going to have data stream capabilities on this guy, so we can read in the data stream and get information such as uh, what the TCU is trying to do, like uh, we can get vehicle speed, uh, we can get the TPS input, and uh, some other stuff. So that could be useful for things. Um, most notably, you could do some kind of protection so that if the data stream is showing that the vehicle speed is too fast to enter a gear it will prevent you from entering the gear so if you try to shift into first when you're going 80 miles an hour it won't let you do that um, it'll probably just grab the the next lowest gear that it, it's it can safely do it but i have to code that in and see how that works and all that crap but that's an idea uh, another thing is automatic torque controller uh, torque converter control so what that would mean is um, the factory service manual specifically says not to use the torque converter um, while you're shifting gears. So this could unlock the torque converter, shift to the next gear, and then lock it back up automatically for you. So it could, you know, micromanage and do stuff like that. But, um, yeah, this is just Gen 1 for if you're trying to use any kind of joystick, input, button, whatever the heck you can think of for um, manual um, gear modes, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, or sequential. So I guess we need to get on to the part, um, the, the complicated part, of what we're going to do for an actual joystick input whatever. This is planned to be a bring-your-own-shifter kit. So you'll get this device, and if you'd like a uh, display, you can get a display so you can see what gear you're in and other information. But this kit is not yet specifically designed, um, it's not going to be sold with a joystick. Um, so that is the biggest thing that I'm trying to figure out is what would be a good universal nice clean uh, input device that people could use because I mean yeah this is kind of cool if you're looking for a gated one through four shifter you know all that fancy joystick stuff but it's large all right this is big it's not very easily to fit this in the dash or you know the the center console and it's also expensive you know if you want to pay a hundred bucks for a new one of these and I don't even know if it comes with the, sw uh, the switch module I mean, so be it. It's a possibility, but it's big and kind of clunky, and, you know, if you've, you've got limited space like I do, where i got stuff all over the place, it's not going to work well. Um, so the first part is going to be finding um, something that will work. So like I mentioned before, we have the options for sequential. 
And an idea that I really like is a smaller joystick like this. Now this is a four direction joystick, you know, just it's it's um, left, right, um, up and down. So what we can do with this guy is sequential. Uh, really basic, really easy. So the way that this would work, it'd be kind of like a Tiptronic. So you take the, the joystick and you push it left to go into um, auto mode or manual mode or whatever. So you could, you know, switch it to change modes. Uh, up shift, down shift, you know, up, up, down, down, whatever the heck you want for changing the gears, and then pop it right for torque converter. So you can lock the torque converter, unlock the torque converter. It's going to manual mode, go up a gear, up a gear, down a gear, down a gear, you know, torque converter on, torque converter off, shit like that. I think that would be really clean, really easy, wouldn't require a really big joystick, and, um, you know, for most people, I think that would do what we want. And there's other options, you know, there's things like this, if you want more like a you know, like a punching bag looking thing or you know there's smaller ones and there's all kinds of different ones you got like like these things like the flying simulator things and other stuff there was one more i thought like just the the full-blown like uh basically like atari looking almost um joystick like one of these guys almost you know something something simple like that even even a guy like that and with the button you might be able to do some interesting fun things with the button so that's um, that's option so far for like a left, right, up, down kind of stick. That is an idea. So yeah, um, if we could find some kind of paddle shifter setup uh, that could easily mount or something, that's a possibility that as well. You know, up shift and down shift, things like that, um, and the works. So that is kind of the idea with the joysticks or and inputs. You can you could use switches. You could use a simple little flippy toggle switch, even. I'll show you that. So if you come into the box of crap, you got like this guy, which could be useful as the like an auto manual switch, so that way you're on manual mode, and then it's got the safety cover to switch it back to auto. That's a good safety switch. Um, we also got switches like these, the toggle switch. So this way, this is momentary, so you go or, well, this one isn't, but you could get one in momentary, but you get the idea. Upshift, and then if you flip it the other direction, downshift kind of deal. So you could do a flip switch like that. Like, you know, we're not limited to giant joysticks. We can use all kinds of small things, micro switches, buttons, crap like that, you know? So if you can dream it, I can probably do it. So, yeah. Tracking down some kind of joystick, that's that's going to be number one for if we want this to be like a full, like a complete package, ready to run uh, setup. So I guess while we're into ideas, uh, part two is I'm thinking about, you saw with Gen 1 that we have data, uh, stuff like that, so that we can kind of do some smart things. Gen 2, we're not as lucky. Because Gen 2 uses um, uh, whatever the hell that shit's called. The, the OBD2... Um, you know, codes and data communications and all that crap. It's way, way, way more complicated than Gen 1. You gotta, like, actually talk to it and request things and check on things and just all kinds of just... <sighs> we'll get there one day, maybe, but it ain't it ain't right now. That's for damn sure. Uh, the biggest problem for these guys is going to be check engine lights. OBD2s love their check engine lights. So, um, in the next version, maybe I'll try to look and see what it will take to fix that. So, for our basic um, check engine light prevention, we have load resistors right here. So these will trick the, um, the computer into thinking that they're still connected to something, and then they'll be happy, ready to go. So, as long as you're not doing anything too ridiculous, that's fine. The problem is going to be... Um, when you start actually changing gears that the computer isn't in. It, the OBD2 actually has two speed sensors, an input speed sensor, an output speed sensor, and they're more, uh, they have more resolution. So they, they can actually tell the difference between one gear and another, if the torque converter is slipping, things like that. So the computer is looking for that difference, and if there's a, a big difference, it's going to throw a code that, hey, something's slipping and doing what it shouldn't be because we're messing around with things that it doesn't know about. So we're going to have to figure out some kind of emulator to uh, emulate the speed sensor and feed the transmission data that'll keep it happy. That's going to be for the next version because that's going to be complicated. It's going to take a lot of testing, and yeah, 
I'm going to need a vehicle or someone that's really smart that can do things and help me out. Because that, that's going to take a lot of poking around. But it's an idea. So if I can figure that out, then this will be a much better solution for OBD2 guys. Because it's, you know, it's not going to mess with anything or break anything. You're not going to have to turn the key off when you're in limp mode and all that crap. It's just, you know, it's good to go. Flip on, flip off. Happy as could be. So sometimes it's better to have dumber computers. Seriously. Makes it easier in the long run when you're trying to do your own stuff. Uh, so yeah, that's the OBD2 setup. So besides the gen um, issues and ideas, uh, the next thing is thinking about how I want to split this up. So after running the vehicle and uh, trying it in in there, I noticed that there were uh, some downfalls and some things that we had to reconsider uh, after messing with this. So this right here is directly out of the AW4 uh, factory service manual. And this is for the, um, uh, whatever the hell this thing is called. This is for the valve body. Okay, so this tells you all the crap that's going on in here and, uh, why the manual shifter, like the, the in-vehicle, you know, range selector is important. So here we have a color-coded chart. Red is first gear, yellow is second gear, green is third gear, and fourth is, or blue is fourth or overdrive. So drive is what we're going to be normally in. So we can see what solenoids are on or off. That's what my thing is doing. All of this stuff is controlled by the vehicle range selector. So I can't mess with any of this stuff. And this is where the problem comes in. So if you're looking for engine braking for first gear and second gear, you can't get that in third. So I uh, will show you what. Let's start turning some of these colors off. So let's just focus on first gear. Now it's a lot easier to see what the problem is. First gear here, we have this first slash reverse brake. This is what gives you the engine braking in first gear. When you're when you throw that shifter all the way to first and you feel you feel the engine just whoom. That's from this guy right here. We can't get that in third. We can't get that in drive. So if you want that, the shifter has to be in first, or you won't get that. So that's problem number one. So if you're on the trail and you just want to switch between first and second, well then hey. Throw it in first, second, and then you can manually choose with whatever joystick, button, input, switch thing that you choose. That's cool. Okay. So, next up, we're going to look at second gear. So, second gear is a little better. So, when we look at this, we can tell that in first, second, and in third, it does the same. So, only in drive does second gear not get this second coast break. That's not as bad. I mean, we still don't get anything in drive, so we'd have to shift down to enjoy it. Uh, we, we'd still have to shift down to get that um, that engine braking, but at least we can get it in third. And we're going to get to why this is usefully important later. So next up, we'll go to third and overdrive, which really doesn't matter. Third is the same. It only works in drive, and it only works in third. So that's that. Um, and then overdrive obviously only works in drive. So if you're in any of these lower modes, you can't physically put it into fourth from what I understand. The overdrive clutch is off, and uh, so is this overdrive one-way clutch. So I'm pretty darn sure you can't put it into fourth gear if you're in third or first second. Because again, this is all mechanical, all controlled by the, the vehicle range selector. Now, what about other things like park, neutral, uh, and reverse? Well, if we look at reverse over here, um, this is technically in first gear. And this is fine, the direct clutch is engaged, but we also have that first reverse brake and the one-way override clutch and all that crap. You can't get to this, that, that is another thing that has to be shifted with the range selector. So you can't accidentally do dumb stuff when you're in you know, drive or whatever, you can't throw it in reverse and uh, vice versa. If you're in reverse, you can't put it in fourth or anything weird like that. So that is the basic idea of what is going on there. So, now that I brought that up, when you're in drive and you put it in first, it's like basically when you're on a bicycle. So you know when you pedal and you pedal and you can feel it's pushing, and then you stop pedaling and the bike just keeps free spinning and, you know, you click, 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 click. That's what it does in drive. So the second you let off the gas, um, the vehicle keeps moving, but the RPMs, you know, drop back down to 1K where it's just where the torque converter is uh, free spinning or whatever. So it's weird. 
So say you get the engine up to like 4, 4K RPM, all right? So you're sitting there, you're on the gas, and you're... the second you, you let off the gas, the RPMs will drop, but the speed keeps going. So the weird thing is in this mode, when you hit the gas again, all of this is, is play. It's like dead, dead range. So you hit the gas and the engine has to go here until it catches onto where it's now pushing the transmission, where it's spinning faster than the transmission, and then boom, right here, and now you get the power and it moves. So it's kind of weird. There's like a delay. It's like it's, it's got to rev up, and then when it finally hits the, the point where it's moving again. So it's, it's weird. It's like a really weird free-spinning kind of thing. But you don't get any engine braking, so you throw it in first, and you're kind of just like cruising and just... You almost feel like you're in neutral. It's like, what the heck's the point? So that's kind of annoying when you're trying to flip through first, second. Like, it's when you're accelerating, it's fine. You know, when you're trying to slam through the gears and you're you're at a red light and you're, you gun it, that's fine. You know, just throw it in first, second, third, overdrive. That's cool. But when you're trying to get that, that engine braking, it's not going to work. So if that's what you're into, you have to move the lever. So that is really something important that I'm trying to drive home here is that I can't do everything I want electronically. Um, so with that in mind, I was thinking, what if instead of doing all this crazy stuff, we make uh, something like a Nifty Shifter Junior? So the idea is no microcontroller. We're talking like bone simple, just no, no fancy smart, just the bare necessities, real cheap, real simple, and convenient. <clears throat> so this is basically what I was messing with here is that we'll have our one through four sh um, switches and we have just some basic electronics that will flip it and supply the load and it'll all be easy beans without a microcontroller. We're, we're gonna have like a uh, an integrated circuit, like a little, little module that looks kind of similar, but it's not like an Arduino or anything that needs to be programmed or expensive or complicated. We're, this is like simple logic gates. It's real, real simple. And it, it's exciting because it, this sounds like a fun project because you got to think with your brain a little bit to make like this little tiny, you know, mechanic, like this little system work. So that is an idea for the junior. Um, and what we're going to use for an input is you could use a one through four like this, or you use the vehicle shifter, and this is how it's going to work. When you're when you shift into drive, it'll just be in third. Okay, so when you switch to manual mode, drive is now third, and that's it. It'll always third. Then when you go to three, it'll be in second gear. So the nice thing is when we're in second gear, hey look, now we get that engine braking that we wanted. And then you go down here into one two, it'll always be first. So that way there's no guessing or thinking. It's it's a you know as manual as you can get. So you got first, you got second, and you got third. Um, if you want overdrive, we could add a switch, maybe, and that could do, yeah, you could, you could do, like, an override switch, and we can also do a torque converter switch. Okay, so that's all manual, uh, and good to go. And here's something interesting someone brought up, uh, I'm really liking the feedback that I'm getting from everyone. If, uh, someone mentioned having either the, the computer control the torque converter, or you control the torque converter, so... Uh, with the, the version 1 boards, that's not really possible, uh, but in version 2, maybe I could do something like that where you could decide, okay, we'll let the computer do its thing, or we can do the thing for it. So the shifter is 1 through 3. You'd need an overdrive switch, and you need a torque converter switch if that's your fancy. Um, and then you'd also need an auto manual switch, or if you are one of the lucky people from like 86 to... I don't know if it's 92 or 93, 94, 95. Somewhere in the HO range is when it stops. But the magical power comfort switch. So we could use that to turn it on and off. So say, for instance, you always want power mode. You're never going to use comfort mode. You don't care. On the board, we'll have a switch so that you can switch it. It'll always be comfort or it'll always be power. And then what we use is we use the switch as the input to flip this. So now on the dash... You're in comfort for auto mode, you push power mode, and now, hey, now you're in manual mode and you can do your manual shifting. So that means that there's no extra things you need to put in the vehicle. You plug this in, you flip a factory switch, you change the factory range selector to get your manual stuff. Completely bare simple, you don't have to mess with anything, you know, factory, everything you could think of. You know, there, there's no, nothing, nothing you got to think about, nothing you got to modify, or anything. It's completely factory. I think that would be really friggin' cool. 
And again, the only thing is uh, you'd be losing out on that power comfort switch. So if you like the comfort mode, which locks the torque converter in third, and, you know, just upshifts earlier for better gas mileage, you know, you'll have to figure out something else. You can add a switch, you know, if, if you want, just add a different switch instead, and you still get the same thing. But the junior idea is going to be cheap, it's going to be simple, and bare bones, nothing smart, nothing ridiculous, just, just simplicity. Um, so that begs the question, what's the point of this over just buttons? Why not just mash through this, uh, you know, yourself? Because they make things like the Baja Shifter, like, uh, Rad Designs, they have a mechanical, purely mechanical, it pushes the buttons for you to grab the gears you want. So why would you get this instead of that? Um, this is really for, um, for simplicity. And like I said, if you want to use the vehicle shifter. So here's a post I post on the Facebook page. So the benefit here, it's a plug-and-play design, so you don't have to cut any wires or anything like that. So you can keep all your factory stuff intact without having to worry about, did I put this in the right spot or whatever? You can easily switch between auto and manual. So this is going to have what you need to switch between, um, you know, controlling it yourself or letting the computer do the work. Um, there's going to be basic CEL prevention, so the check engine light won't go off unless you're doing some crazy stuff. But it won't throw right away. Here is one of the bigger things, though, is holding the gear between uh, switches. So, with that in mind, you could use a button. A simple push button, like this. So you don't have to hold it the entire time you want the gear. You push it, and with this fancy stuff, it'll lock. So when you push the button, it'll remember what you, you pushed and save that. So that's a save state. So when you're, when you're between a gear, right? When you're between a gear, say you, you're in fourth and you want to go to third, or when you're in third, you want to go to fourth, or whatever. When you're in between buttons, there's no inputs. This will always default to fourth, right? So if you're over here and you want to go first, and you're like lazily shifting to second, it's basically first, fourth, second. So with this here, it'll remember the state between shifts and hold it. So that way you can use push buttons, you can have slow moving things, and you're not going to flip through gears and all that crap. So that's, that's the thing, is holding gears. Uh, also, what we can do is we can still add a display for this super manual mode um, and have a gear readout so that you can see what gear you're in, but the only downfall is this is only going to work when you're in manual mode. So we can have a normal, um, just like seven digit display, like on a clock or whatever, like like one of these things. It would just be one, one digit that shows you the number. Um, so you'd have one through four, and then I think I can run the torque converter uh, to light up the decimal point. So that's an idea for that. Um, and that would be really cheap. It'd just be a simple little thing just like this with a screen that you can plug in and decide if you want it or not. But that is the junior idea in a nutshell. It's just really, it's, it's simplicity. As simple as I can make it, and it sounds like a lot of fun. Um, and, and I should go over one more thing. This, uh, this setup can be used, um, as a as a pass through device, as you see through uh, as you see here, so it'll plug into the computer and the wiring harness, and it'll pass through when you need it, or take control, or you can use this as a standalone. You can say, you know, forget this. We don't need any smart fancy computers. You got yourself a rock bouncer or a crawler or some mud you know mud thing, and you you always want manual. You don't care what it's doing. You just want a simple manual thing. This can work too. We can get rid of these wires and just have this and plug this into the factory harness and you get all manual control and um, you don't have to mess with anything. So that's another idea if you're looking for standalone. Uh, one thing that I do want to bring up though, uh, due to the simplicity, how simple this project is going to be, it's not going to be able to do sequential. All right, So it's only going to be a manual mode, you know, one, two, three, four. We can't upshift, downshift, kind of thing like that. That's just one of the downfalls of making something silly simple. Um, is the logic would get really overcomplicated without a microcontroller. So that's why the version one's so nice, is since we have a microcontroller, we can code things, we can do whatever we want. So when we come in here, we got all this stuff. So we can sit here and we can sense the gears and we can see what gear we're in. We can, you know, have all these buttons do things and have all this smart logic and see things, test things, have outputs and stuff like that. So that's the nice thing with a uh, microcontroller is you have more more ways to do things simpler. Code is great. As long as you can think it up, it'll work. Uh, but that's a junior. So, with a junior, we would also have a pro mode. 
So we'd have the Nifty Shifter Pro. It would basically be just like this. Um, and I might be able to build the, the shifter thing built in, the, the vehicle shifter with the power comfort switch. So that's an idea I might be able to build in the Pro mode. So if you didn't want to connect a controller and you just wanted that, you could do that with a smarter screen. So if I can figure out the, um, the speed sensor trickery for OBD2, the Pro version would be able to do that and keep your, your check engine light off all the time. Um, you can get sequential, so you can have your upshift, downshift, things like that. You can have smart modes. You can use the data to your advantage. Um, but the other interesting thing um, that I'm thinking about is maybe stepping up the screen. This is a pretty boring screen. There's nothing too too fancy about it. It's kind of, you know, ugly with the lines and all that stuff. And you can't fit a lot of data on it. Uh, so, believe it or not, I'm not the first guy to do this, okay? There's other people on the internet that have thought of this and done this design way earlier than I have. So this is a guy, I forget the exact company, but he was working on this about five years ago. Um, and he had, I don't, I think that was the toggle switch to upshift, downshift, or, or maybe it was this thing. I'm, I'm not sure exactly what it was. That might have been the power switch and that big joystick was up and down. But, what if we did a smarter screen? Something we can put a lot of stuff on. So here, we've got a giant gear thing. We can see what mode you're in. We can see if the torque converter is locked or unlocked real easy. And the biggest feature is temperature. Temperature would be really friggin' fancy, wouldn't it? I think that would be a really good feature for a higher end, uh, model product. You know, nice, nice cool screen with temperature. So if, if uh, I were to include a temperature sensor, we can screw it in. Uh, 97 and below, there's a threaded port. You just thread the friggin' thing right in there, good to go. 98 and above, or if you want to do a different thing, we'll have to figure out a different sensor. But transmission temperature, man, that could be a pretty helpful selling feature, especially with a nice pretty screen like that. I could see that going well. Uh, another thing with the Pro Mode is having a button a button system on here so that we can change the menus and stuff like that. I found one I was actually really happy with uh, that I want to buy and try because it's a tiny little uh, two-way selector, John, and it's really neat. So this right here is a joystick or, you know, a thumb wheel, if you will, and it's just two simple buttons. You got left or right, but if you push it down, it pushes both so that we have, you know, left, right, and down. So that way we can flip between menus, we can select things, stuff like that, and I can put that on the screen so that we can uh, change through menus and set options and all that stuff real easily. Because right now, <coughs> we're limited to uh, just the shifter itself. So it's a little clunkier, a little harder to remember, and it's just not as clean. So that's an idea uh, for the Pro Mode as well. It's a nice fancy screen and stuff like that. So I feel kind of bad that I've been talking my ass off and you haven't really got to see this thing in action. Um, you know, recently anyway. So uh, one of the problems with LEDs is uh, their contrast is kind of ass. So in the daylight, it's hard to see. So let's simulate that. Oh look, we're in the daytime. What the heck does this screen say? It's a little hard to say. Well, my friend, welcome to the world of contrast. Now, how's that for readability, huh? Ain't that pretty. And it dims it, so at night, it's, uh, it's less bright. So there you go, that's that. This is, um, just, uh, some, you know, tinted acrylic that you can get. And it makes it look a lot cleaner. So we could do that to make it look pretty. So that's an idea. Um, but I'm trying to work on smart modes and things like that. So here is, uh, what I have figured out right now. We figured out a way to use a, an input code to go between auto mode and manual mode, so you don't even need an auto manual switch. So as long as you're fine with inputting some kind of code, this makes it easier, because unless you have an easy to guess code, people are less likely to mess up um, your vehicle if they accidentally turn your shifter on. If you let your girlfriend or someone else you know, drive the vehicle, you might not want them messing around with a manual shifter. So you can put a hidden switch somewhere, or you can input a code. So it would work like this. The current code on this is one, two, three, four. So one, two, three, and four, and now the screen is red. So now we're in manual mode, and if you check over here, our LEDs are going to turn on and off to display what gear we're in and all that stuff. Um, and for this one, I haven't coded it in yet, but he wants it so that when we're in fourth gear, the torque converter will light up. So that'll be good as well. 
So, the question is, well, how do you get out of a uh, manual mode? You can't input it. I mean, you could input the same pattern, but that might be really annoying, especially if you're trying to drive. Uh, so what instead I, I thought up is we just leave it neutral. So you'll see there's a little countdown, and then poof, you're back in uh, auto mode. Good to go. Now you can mess around with this and play with it, and it's not going to do anything dumb unless you, you enter the code. So this gets rid of a switch, so now you don't need an auto manual uh, switch. You can just enter a code. So I can probably set it up so that you can add your own code and change it whenever you want, stuff like that. So that's, you know, an easy feature that we can do with Logic. That's the nice thing with microcontrollers. They think for you. Um, but yeah, on top of this, if you guys are interested in serial, if there's any nerds like that, this has serial output, uh, which, you know, I'm pretty sure I showed in the video. But, if you like Arduino, we can go, uh, come on, serial monitor, uh, port, gotta get the first port first. Come on, you bloody bastard. Okay, so here's serial, so it dumps out everything that you can see here. So we can see all the button states, we can see, um, you know, what gear the shifter's in, we can see all the output states, we can see if manual mode's on, what the gear, what it reads as the gear. Uh, we can see the voltage of each solenoid, things like that. And uh, for Gen 1 guys, we can also see the data stream because uh, it has a direct connection to the data stream. So we can also get things like this. So we can see the time, we can see um, you know, the TPS, we can see how fast the, um, uh, the vehicle's moving, other options with the TCU, things like that. So you could also get the data stream from it as well for uh, diagnostics and seeing error codes. And, oh, that's another thing we could do with that fancy, with the pro mode, you could see error codes if the TC was uh, ever thrown anything. But that's an idea. So yeah, serial, that's a cool thing that we can do too. Um, but yeah, I think that's all the ideas and options and features I can think of so far. I really like the joystick thing. I really like the vehicle shifter thing with the, uh, the junior idea. So I'm gonna see where I go. But if any of this stuff uh, sticks out and sounds interesting, let me know. If you got any other ideas, also let me know. You know, there's the possibilities are endless. It just depends what people really need. And again, uh, there was uh, another. There was someone that uh, mentioned that they found something else. The AW4 Matic uh, was a project that was made quite a while ago. Someone uh, brought this to my attention. Uh, it even had like a Facebook page. But this is actually uh, like an overseas project, which is neat. Um, so this was an idea that they put together with a simple little display. And uh, it's got some smart stuff in there. So like I said, this, this design isn't, isn't new. You know, it, it has been uh, thought up before. The damn thing would show. But yeah, it's just a little display and some inputs and things. That's really cool. So that's the AW4 Matic. So I mean, with the simplicity of this project, you know, just about anyone can figure it out. Give it enough time. So you can see there, he's got a little sequential setup. You know, real simple, real clean, with a nice little uh, momentary toggle switch. So that's pretty neat. You know, there's all kinds of things you can do with this. So that's pretty nice. I dig it. All right, so if you made it this far, now let's get to some tech talk. All right, let's see uh, what I did wrong or what I changed or what could be different and stuff like that. So the first part, if uh, anyone's got some good eagle eyes, you'll notice this disgusting little mod over here. So uh, I found out that I wired the damn thing up backwards. Um, the These are for the three solenoids, and I put the, like, the input on the connector and the output on the adapter and it's it's the wrong way around so basically I wasn't doing what I was supposed to so I do this ugly little mod just to get it to work but that's the problem with prototypes you know it's, it's hard to tell what's gonna go wrong till you actually try it so I've got a bunch of boards that I'll have to modify but I can still make it work so that's the first thing is I got the damn thing switched around the wrong way and that's just part of making sure you really know how to read your schematic uh, part two over here I thought it would be a smart idea to put the relay coils on the uh, the small fuse 
you know, because since it's being switched through this little tiny transistor, if it's drawing a lot of power, I don't want the transistor to blow up. So I figured, oh, that'll be smart and clever and all that. We'll just run the power there. I forgot that the damn 12 volt trace that does the load is also on that. So now it's trying to source three amps of current through a little fucking 500 milliamp fuse and it's not working. So to freak out every time you try to put it in gear. So I had to do a nice little bodge job there to cut the trace and um, tap it back in. So that way um, it's taking power before the fuse, not after. So that's another thing that needs to get fixed. Other things, just real basic, like spacing. I didn't give enough space for these resistors, so I can't actually push them all the way down or the relays stick out. Um, just part of how I am. I love making things as small and tight as possible, and it doesn't always work out. Um, but besides that, I might, I might change the voltage regulator uh, to something that's a little different, but, you know, just a couple little part changes here or there. Uh, but those are the main main things. So those were the issues I ran into, along with wanting to add inputs for like the sh yeah, the vehicle shifter inputs and things like that. Um, so on to the connectors. This side actually works out pretty well. The only problem is I have to shave down the um, the the nubs, the alignment tabs, because none of the ones I can buy online match the damn factory one. Here's this black one where the tabs are too far in, and on this purple one tabs are too far out and uh it just it wasn't working because when we look at this the tabs are like in the middle so when we look at these they're in different positions and it's just it's not it's not pretty it's not off by much but it's enough to not friggin fit so for the purple side i'm probably gonna, just going to order the black ones from now on because they're easier to uh i think they're a little cheaper and it looks a little better than this goofy purple uh, but I have to take them and grind down the tabs so they'll slide into the factory one, so that's fun. And you guessed it, on the other side we also have alignment issues. So over here, I had to accommodate for the different slots, because guess what? The HO alignment tabs are different from the Renix tabs, so I had to accommodate for that. So I made a little uh, print jig here that we can use to drill it out. Uh, it needs a little bit of alignment work, but it kind of worked. I was trying to think of a good way to actually cut these tabs, because this is what we got. And we've got pins in here, and, you know, there's not a lot of room. It's not like you could really get it like a saw blade, because it goes deeper than all this crap, and it's like all weird. So what we do is just plug this, you know, slide that into there, and then take a drill bit and drill that out so you get your uh, your alignment tabs. So then that'll work. So yeah, that was the fun for OBD1, like the Gen 1s. Uh, Gen 2 is a little bit different, but luckily I didn't have to do any of the hard work. You know, the guys on here, like on Facebook, are awesome. You guys are really helping me out. Uh, so someone actually uh, made a forum post and showed every single friggin' adapter. So they made it really easy to figure out and find and all that crap. I'd have to go back um, on a couple posts... But uh, he has the forum page and everything on there and all that crap. Oh, I'd have to dig through it. But he, he posted every single adapter that we need. So the fun part, or not so fun part, is that 1997, they made a connector that was different. And I'm like, okay, cool. And then 98, they must have changed some more shit and went with a different connector. So if you're 1997, you need a different connector than the 98 to 01. So that's kind of annoying. So I bought all these freaking things. I had to go through like four different uh, distributors to get all the parts. But we got the 98 up, and then we have just the 97. So I got one of those to try. I've got all these damn friggin' things here. So I got to crimp all the wires, put them all together. I got spools of wires so I can sit there and actually build them. It's not the worst thing in the world to have to build wires, especially with the crimp tool that I have, but it is time consuming and a little annoying. Not nearly as fast as just dropping a connector in and soldering them in. But, yeah. So there's that. I'm also working on the case to try to get this to fit, because like I said, the, the first one was way too tight, and I had to like melt it and grind it and do a bunch of shit, and it still didn't fit right. So we're going to print another test one and see how we're doing. So yeah. That's, uh, I think that's where we're at. I feel like I'm rambling a lot. This is probably starting to get pretty boring. But, uh, that is the Nifty Shifter, uh, progress so far. So hopefully, 
you know, in, a, in another week or two, they'll finally be ready for, um, you know, for sale, so I can put them online and uh, all that stuff. So until then, I guess, uh, see what you would want from one of these things, what would be nice, and just all kinds of crap like that. But yeah, lots of possibilities. <laughs> Then, if we go in the secret order, got our one, two, three, four. Okay, check that out. So the interesting thing is that it shows zero right now, which is weird, because I don't know how the hell it would show zero. Hmm. So we can see the LEDs over here are shifting. Got one, two, three, four. But our screen is doing silly things. Hmm. Well, I'm gonna hit that with a the thermal camera and see if uh, anything's blowing up. Okay, so we're looking at the thermal camera here. You can see a couple things. The bottom right spot is our transistor that is driving the relays. Uh, at the top right, you can see the fuse for um, all the inputs and actually the solenoid driving, which uh, I have to put a bigger one in, but I just wanted to check the temperature of that thing with two of these going. It's a little hard to tell. And then we see our voltage regulator over here popping a nice 150. So let's see, can I cover this? And she's only reading 90. Amazing. Okay. Huh. Alright, not bad. And then watch what happens when we throw this into fourth. So. None of the solenoids are being driven. Things should cool down a little bit. And we're going to throw this into neutral here. Three, four, five. Okay, just flicked off. You can see that transistor's cooling off now. And already gone. Uh, it's always some kind of head scratcher. Okay, so we've got uh, everything set up. I just wrote a little debug uh, code. So we can see the input of all the buttons. We can see what the shifter reads. We can see what all the outputs are. The manual mode, what the gear reads in the... What the, what the gear reads. Uh, the voltage of all three solenoids. So when we take our shifter... And we put it into like first. Let's see, first works, and button one uh, goes false, which is normal because it's inverted. Let's see two, Let's see three, and then we switch to four. Um, this output should turn on, and then we should be in manual mode. So we do four. Okay, you heard the little flick. So now the output here is on. Manual mode is on, but gear one reads one, even though shifter reads four. We come over here, solenoid 1 is still reading 10.8 volts, and the other two read 5.7, and I don't know why. So if I shift into third, this will command the second solenoid. So now second solenoid is 10 volts, but the first one still has voltage, and I don't know why. So I need to make sure all the relays are set up and nothing's fucking short and doing dumb shit, because something don't make sense here. Because in fourth gear, none of these should be active. All these should read 0 volts, so where is this voltage coming from? Something ain't right. And as you can see, it's reading first because it's seeing solenoid one. So if we take the shifter and throw the shifter into first, the voltage doesn't change a whole lot. So I don't know. This is a little strange. Okay, so I came in here and just unplugged the TCU for now so we can test this. And now, when we look at this, if we throw it into third gear, see that? Solenoid 2 is now getting 10 volts. Throw out in a second, both of them come on. Throw out in first, only the first one's on. So everything works the way it should. And um, if we throw this into neutral, let it count down. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and it turns off. So everything's working the way that it should there. So for some reason when it's plugged into the TCU, some funny stuff is happening. So I gotta figure out what the heck is going on with these relays, because I might have not wired them up correctly. I don't know, I'll have to see what the hell's going on in there.
Ah, uh, yes, a classic case of you done fucked up. So I figured it out. So our wired connection here is what goes to the TCU. And if you notice, this one is connected directly to our output over here. So that is where our issue is. This one, this wire is supposed to go to the connector because this is our drive to the solenoid. And our common should instead go to the wire because that's the one that we want to flip back and forth for the TCU for the load. So, yeah, we got our wires backwards, yay! So we would have to figure out how to switch this pin and that pin for all three of them. Oh, fuck. I love fucking schematics. But this uh, does explain something. So remember when we were getting those weird analog readings over here? Where like, we were getting like 5 volts and we weren't sure why? Well, it's because that's probably how the TCU detects a fault. So what we're doing uh, accidentally now is um, we have this mixed up, right? So when we're trying to drive this, we're driving the computer and the solenoids are being disconnected. So the solenoids are here um, and they're just being disconnected over here. So they're going to ground, that's no problem. Over here, the reason why we go over here and we're seeing five volts on our sense line over here is probably because that's what the TCU uses to uh, tell when there's a fault. So it'll drive it at like five volts and it'll read the line. And if the line's at 5 volts, then we can tell that something's probably not right. I think, because the solenoid should still should still bring that to ground. So when it's disconnected, it'll sit high and then problems. So, yeah, that's probably why we're getting that weird 5 volt reading when it's off anyway. I tell you what, there is an art to modifying circuit boards. <laughs> it is a useful skill to have. So I got the pins bent out of there. What a pain in the ass. I had this on the holder so I could touch the bottom here and then use pliers and screwdrivers and whatever the hell I could get to pop those pins out. Took the wires out. So now we're going to swap the wires there and put the pins there. And they probably won't reach so we'll have to do a little jumper but yeah and then it should work. Like I said, it's an art. <laughs> so we've swapped the wires and the pins. Everything's looking pretty good, so I think we can still make this work. Let's give her a go. Okay, so now we're hooked up again. You can see we're running at 9.7 volts, 5, like 0 0.5, 0 0.0. So that is good. So that's that. And that's in normal mode. So, now if we take our joystick, and we go 1, 2, three and four. Okay, we're in manual mode. Hey, look at that, all the solenoids are zero. And check it out. If we go over here, see that zero, zero at the bottom right? No transmission codes either. Yeah, buddy, the load resistors work. Ha ha, motherfucker. Okay, okay. Now then, for the real test. So you see our screen's in fourth. Flip this to third. Okay, uh, mm. Well, that's not pretty. So we're commanding solenoid 2, but we're only getting like four, there's three or four volts on that. That is ass. Um, so, I'm gonna get out the thermal camera and see if that fuse is uh, finally freaking out, if it's if it's trying to push too much power now. Because it is a very low fuse, and they're supposed to draw like 700 milliamps, and the trip's at 500. So yeah, another wiring goof again. Me being a retard. Okay, so looking here, on the thermal camera, you can see the topmost resistor is glowing. So somewhere around 90 to 100 degrees. So that's good, she's not gonna burn out. And it is taking the load of the transmission computer. So now we're gonna shift this into third and see if we get a thermal runaway here. Eh, surprisingly no craziness. See um, in the middle, that chip number two it's starting to warm up a little bit. Fuse is up to about 115, 120, but that's still nowhere near the trip, I think. But yeah, it's definitely getting too hot. But we're only getting like 3 or 4 volts, so I wonder what the deal is there. Well, we're really going to stress test this and throw her into second. Oh, fuck, are we? Okay. So... 
Huh. It's still reporting voltage and everything is like doing stuff. I wonder if it's because the 5 volt um, John Ski's going on. I bet you if I unplug the USB, this thing's gonna die. I was gonna say, why isn't it dead yet? Because if you look, it's only pushing out like 3 volts. Oh, duh, you can't see that with a thermal camera. Dirt, dirt. Anyway, uh, okay, so here's a test. We're gonna unplug the USB. And I think it just thermally reset. Because all the relays clicked off. So let's let's throw it back in. So we'll do one. Let's see if I can fucking keep you focused here. Okay. One. So it's not a two. Come on, you fucker. Three and four. Okay, we're in manual mode. I wasn't listening to it if it clicked, so we're gonna swap just uh, solenoid two on here. Yeah, you see that it clicked off? Yeah, that fuse is drawn way too much. Of course. So we'll have to put a different fuse in there now. Okay, so now I got it in here. I've got the uh, our stuff flipped around for the solenoids themselves. In here, I got a jumper uh, for the uh, the small fuse, so everything's okay there. And uh, we got it wired this way, and she's working great. No real hot temperature spikes. Everything seems to work. Nothing's cutting out. It's all good in the hood. Gee. I think we're ready for a test. I dig it. I dig it a lot. Go back to auto mode. Hey. <laughs> Motherfucker. Okay, so here we are now. I took the, uh, the small fuse that we were having issues with and jumped... Um, uh, I, I cut off the trace and jumped it, so now none of the current is going through that fuse, so it's only protecting the microcontroller now, and you can see that the diode's starting to warm up now, so this is with two of the, um, the load drivers running, I mean, if you notice, the load drivers aren't even that warm, not bad at all, our little relay diode over there, or diode trend, or fuck, our re relay transistor over there is doing okay, and the warmest thing, surprisingly, is actually our, our super diode at the uh, the top, which is for all the main power. And then, obviously, our regulator, which now I'm impressed that it's a little lower. But it seems to work. Cool. I'm happy with that. So I think we can try a test drive now.